session to go. We have, are going to wrap this up with a really interesting panel on ICOs and cryptocurrency. Um, we have a really excellent moderator who I'm going to quickly introduce, and then he's going to take charge of the rest of the, uh, the session for the day. Uh, Kevin Cirilli is uh, Bloomberg TV's chief Washington correspondent uh, and specializes in White House and congressional coverage. Uh, he was previously a reporter for Politico and The Hill, uh, where he spent most of his time focused on the intersection of Wall Street and Washington. Um, during the 2016 election, however, he was uh, a member of the Trump Traveling Press Corps. Uh, so he had a lot of opportunities to interview the president, and is a really interesting guy, has lots of great stories you can ask him about afterward. Turning it over to Kevin. Thanks, guys. Um, can everybody hear me? So we're the grand finale. I promise to wrap this up by 3.15. But uh, for our panelists, we've got some great panelists, and they're going to tell me a little bit about themselves, and then we'll have an opportunity to open it up for some questions about the regulatory landscape of the White House and Washington with regards to this exciting new technology. First up, Barry Silbert. He is the founder and CEO of the Digital Currency Group. Barry, over to you. <laughs> and you'll talk for a couple of minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, great. We've got slides, I think. Hey. Um, all right. Um, good afternoon. All right. Who's ready to talk about crypto? Okay. Who holds crypto here? Put your hand up. All right. Great. The AV team. I know the AV team does. Awesome. All right. Great. So um, first, uh, who we are. It's a digital currency group. Uh, we are a company. We're not a fund. Uh, we have, do three things. One, we own companies. So we own Genesis Trading, a regulated broker dealer. We own Grayscale Investments, which is the largest asset manager uh, in the crypto space, about two billion in AUM. And we own Coindesk, the leading media company in the space, uh, which has a fantastic conference coming up this month in New York called Consensus. Hopefully you all are joining. Number two, we make investments. We invest in seed stage companies primarily. We've invested in over 120 companies in 30 countries. Folks like Coinbase and Ripple and BitPay and all the folks who have gone on to create some value so far. And then lastly, we invest directly in digital currencies. Uh, we're big believers in the opportunity to invest in these protocols. We're excited about five of them, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Zencash, and Decentraland. We have a fantastic group of investors. When I raised money, the idea was let's bring on strategic folks who are intellectually curious and want to figure out what blockchain means to them. MasterCard and Western Union and Foxconn and a bunch of other really, really great investors that are super engaged, super helpful. This is our portfolio, uh, 120 companies, 30 countries, ranging from wallets to custodians to exchanges to compliance software. If you've heard of a use case for blockchain and crypto, there's probably a company that we've backed. So what is happening in the space? Okay, so number one, uh, I think it's fair to say that most people now believe that digital currency is here to stay. A decentralized form of money is not going away. Next. Blockchain use cases, non-financial blockchain use cases are exploding. I love to see the innovation that's happening. Jobs are being created and real value is being created as well. There's $400 billion now in the crypto asset class around the world. That's from zero about eight years ago. $400 billion of value created. We're seeing massive transactional growth in the usage of cryptocurrencies around the world, and not just in the US, but emerging markets as well. One that I'm really, really excited about, Bitcoin as a financial rail, so not as a speculative investment, as a financial rail, is now being used to move money cross-border in certain corridors in a way that's faster and cheaper than traditional means. Places like Mexico and India and throughout Africa and the Philippines, faster and cheaper now to send money using Bitcoin into those markets. Banking continues to be a real, real issue for our companies around the world. We're seeing a massive bubble in ICOs, greed and really bad behavior across the board. The futures markets are opening up, which may lead to ETFs. Wall Street is getting ready to hop into this asset class. And I assume off the screen, yep, off the screen, institutional investors uh, while they're digging in on this asset class, have not yet put any money into this asset class. All right, so what are the opportunities for policymakers? So one, ICOs, I'm sure we'll talk about it on the panel. Um, I don't have the answers, but clarity is needed. ETFs, there's probably been a couple dozen ETF applications that have been filed with the SEC. The 
The SEC has yet to approve one of them. Taxes. Uh, the investors in the space are happy to pay taxes, but they need some clarity uh, around what in-kind exchanges of crypto means. And also, it would be fantastic to have some de minimis exemption that al allows people to use crypto without having to pay taxes on it. Banking. What can we do to make it easier for companies involved in this asset class to get bank accounts? Um, and finally, owning a broker-dealer, we know firsthand how difficult it is for a regular broker-dealer to trade in the asset class given the impact that it has on their net capital. That's all I got. Talk to you soon. All right, thank you, Barry. I thought it was interesting about Africa and the development opportunities, especially because what you see with telecom in particular in Africa is interesting. Next up, we have Peter v Van Valkenburg, he is the director of research for Coin Center and an NYU grad. Which, if anyone go to NYU? No? For, for law school. Some, some people. <laughs> All right, there you go. All right, thanks for having me. Um, Coin Center is a nonprofit research and advocacy organization that's based right here in Washington, D.C., and our primary purpose is to educate folks in government about cryptocurrencies and open blockchain technologies. So this presentation that I'm about to speed through is much longer, and if you really want a good base of knowledge about how these technologies work and what the policy implications are, contact me and I'll go through it slowly. <laughs> so I'm titling it, What are Decentralized Apps, Coins, Tokens, and ICOs, which is a huge range of topics, but there's two things I'm not gonna cover. First of all, I'm not talking about true tokenized securities. So if somebody has you know, fractional ownership interests in a corporation, wants to trade them on a blockchain, I'm not talking about that. It might be a good use case for blockchain technology, but I'm not talking about that. And I'm also not talking about scams. There's a lot of things in the world being sold that masquerade as what I'm about to describe, as a decentralized network that provides some utility and has a token, but really they're just scams. These are things that are rightly the targets of uh, securities uh, regulation, uh, especially the anti-fraud provisions of the Securities Acts. So I'm not gonna talk about those. This presentation will cover tokens that power decentralized apps. And as um, Barry Silbert just said, one decentralized app that seems like it's here to stay is decentralized money. And that is um, basically Bitcoin. But if we think about what is a decentralized app, we can start with a centralized app like PayPal and figure out what they do. PayPal allows you to send money to somebody else through the internet. And they do it by performing three functions, hopefully well. The first function is they open accounts for people and they keep track of usernames and passwords. It's authentication. The second function is record keeping. They keep track of who's paid who and how much and they make sure the books balance at the end of the day. And the third function is oversight. Somebody within PayPal is making sure that the teams doing authentication and record keeping are doing a good job so that the business works the way it's supposed to work. How do we turn PayPal, this internet company for sending money online, into a decentralized network. This is the magic of blockchain technology, which is sometimes overhyped, but I think in the case of decentralized money is very real. We're gonna have a bunch of computers do what this centralized company did. We're going to network them together using peer-to-peer -to -peer protocols like BitTorrent. And then all of these functions have to be turned into automated things that every computer on the network can perform independently such that no person needs to trust any one computer on the network to perform that function. Every computer performs it independently. That's why it's decentralized. That's why it's low trust or no trust, if you will. So authentication is done by doing public key cryptography, math that every computer can independently verify rather than relying on a centralized database of usernames and passwords. The record of transactions is decentralized. It's distributed, a DLT, it's a blockchain, and every computer on the network stores a copy of who's paid who, how much, and makes sure the books balance. And the oversight and management function, who's making sure that all the computers are behaving honestly? There isn't one, because that would be centralized. Instead, because all those other functions can easily be mathematically verified, an algorithm simply hands a reward, an incentive, to the computer on the network every 10 minutes or so that most faithfully performs those functions according to the rules of the software. And that's Bitcoin. And it's amazing and strange, but it works. You can send a good deal of money with very little fees through this network, and there's no company in between. Now you might say, why do we need this Bitcoin token thing? It's strange, it's confusing. The first thing I'd say is Bitcoin is one of several tokens. 
some of these tokens are now being sold to the public through ICOs. All these technologies are similar. So these things aren't really distinct. The second thing I would say is that you need the token, whether it's Bitcoin or some other use case, like a non-financial use case, because you need to have a reward that can be granted algorithmically to the participants. If you rely on somebody to choose who gets a reward or not, it's not algorithmic. It's not decentralized. You've reintroduced centralization. So you need this native asset to reward participants. You need the token to use the app. Because if you're going to use this system that does something, I'm going to use PayPal and it's decentralized. I'm going to use a decentralized network for something. You need to reward the participants for your use, for providing that functionality. And so you're going to use that token to pay for the service, basically, when you use the service. And finally, it's the unit of account for the network because a blockchain couldn't have a dollars as a unit of account because a blockchain is just data and a data structure has no authority over dollars, which are, of course, liabilities on the balance sheets of banks and things like that. So it needs a native asset that it can actually have control over. And then what is this network and this software? Well, the network are people and companies around the world, several of which Barry is invested in and other people invested in, and they're all independent and they're unaffiliated with each other. And what they do is they run open source software that connects to the network and in some cases uh, enforces the rules of the network. And then what is this software that all these people are running? Well, it's open source code. So if you're familiar with Linux, it's rather like Linux. It's a code base that has no single author, no single company behind it. In fact, there's something like 350 some independent persons who've contributed to the code repository that is Bitcoin's core software and growing. So I can go into more detail about these things but don't have time. This is how the accounting and record keeping happens, decentralized. This is how we actually have user authentication, decentralized. And this is the incentive mechanism where miners give themselves a reward to perform all these verifiable functions. But I'm not going to do that because I don't have time. <laughs> now, we can also talk about other apps. Let's decentralize Amazon's cloud storage business because it'd be fun. It's all the same things that we're turning into automated functions. You have accounts, you have records of where files are stored and who's, who has access to a file and who's paid for storage. The only difference is every computer now is adding a hard drive to the network so that they can perform a cloud storage function as a decentralized cloud, as a real cloud, as opposed to just Amazon S3 servers that Amazon controls. And the management or oversight function is the same. People are rewarded for providing cloud storage to this network that anybody can access because they get some sort of financial reward in the form of a token. And there's other use cases, which we can talk about in some other talk. And then the final question is, where did these tokens come from? Well, in many cases, they come from the protocol only. So all Bitcoins that are in circulation were given out to somebody as a remining for keeping the blockchain and performing the, the valuable functions that allow that network to work. They're all given in kind for work given to the network. But you could also imagine people who develop software where in the first block of the blockchain, the blockchain is the record of who has which tokens, if you will, certain numbers of tokens are given to the developers. And maybe the developers retain them as an incentive for developing the software. Or maybe they sell them to interested investors in order to finance their software development efforts. This is called a pre-mine or a pre-sale and when you sell to the general public an initial coin offering, a very unfortunate phrase that some lunatic in our community came up with thinking it was clever. Um, and the reason for that is it, well, it brings up IPOs, which is something the SEC regulates, and a lot of these people don't think they're regulated by the SEC. And then the final option here is airdrops. So you, there's a current state of the Bitcoin blockchain. You can publicly see it. You can see. All of these accounts have these different uh, amounts of Bitcoin in them. You could copy that current state and award a new token in proportion to the amount of Bitcoins held by every person on the network. And th so you're basically airdropping your new token project, whether it's decentralized Amazon or decentralized whatever, to everybody who already has Bitcoin as a way of getting distribution out there. That's called an airdrop. So anyway. This all brings up the question of securities law, among other policy questions. So I'll just quickly tee that up before shutting up and getting on. Um, securities law really boils down to two questions. Is the thing being sold an investment? And is there a person upon whom investors rely? You answer yes to both of those, you sold a security. 
And the intuition here is gold is often sold as an investment, but there's no one person upon whom investors rely. It's physics and the markets that determine the value of gold. Whereas when Tim Cook sells you shares of Apple stock, you are relying on a person. So of course shares of Apple stock, amongst other things, are securities. So with respect to tokens, we can ask these questions. Is a token desirable for investment purposes or because people want to use it, say to get cloud storage? And second, what's backing up that value? Is there one person like Tim Cook or a group of people upon whom we're relying? Or is it a giant network of persons like the gold industry? You answer investment and issuer, you've got a security, even though the thing looks like a token and people might think it's not a security. You answer utility and issuer, or utility and network, or investment and network, it's a gray area. So this is what I mean by investment versus utility. Do you get a function out of the system, or do you just get um, uh, uh, a return on your investment? And this is what I mean by issuer versus network. PayPal is a centralized company. And of course, my example earlier, Bitcoin is a network of participants. So in theory, there's no common enterprise which would make it a security. With these two axes, we can graph what securities regulation might look like with respect to tokens. We're going to put useful tokens on the bottom, like I get cloud storage from this token, and investment tokens on the top. And then on the left side of the graph, we're going to get network-backed tokens, where it's really a decentralized group of participants, where we don't rely on a centralized issuer. And on the right, we're putting issuer. Now, in the real world, we've got all these things, like Tim Cook in the upper right, gold in the left, fuel and real estate in the lower left. Commodities are in the lower left, and securities are in the upper right. And really, there are these edge cases as well, which all have interesting jurisprudence, but we don't have time to talk about them. Now, we can put tokens all over this map. And I'm going too fast now for the computer. And we can put them arbitrarily where we think they belong. Now, some things to point out. If you pre-sell some tokens, because you're promising people that you're going to build something like Bitcoin, and you want to get investment for that now, you want to do capital formation, and then you hand the tokens out later once the network's actually decentralized, that moment is sort of distinct from the decentralized network itself. For that period, for that duration before there is a decentralized network, people in many ways are relying on you, an issuer, to deliver this future functionality. But maybe, once the network's live and running, they're no longer relying on you, and in reality, it really is a decentralized network. So the intuition here, which is quite interesting, is that a pre-sale of tokens might be securities issuance, even though the tokens that ultimately result from that pre-sale might be more like digital commodities. This is a really interesting public policy question, and you'll hear things like the simple agreement for future tokens as a, I've totally broken this thing now, <laughs> as a possible means of complying with securities laws during the pre-sale. We're gonna do a, a regulated offering under Reg D5, uh, Rule 506 or something like that, but the tokens delivered later for a decentralized Amazon or what have you are not securities. And so we put things on this graph and it all becomes very complicated because there's tokens that look like everything. As Giancarlo just recently said, most of these things, cryptocurrencies, tokens, have the qualities of currencies, securities, and commodities. I think he said that yesterday. And the issue with a regula from a regulatory standpoint is that once you think about regulation, maybe this is the area of SEC jurisdiction, mostly in the upper right. But it could also be broader or it could be more narrow because the SEC has a flexible test for what qualifies as a security. It could be there, it could include some of the projects that we currently don't think of as securities, or it could be more narrow. Coin Center advocates for this more narrow interpretation because we think this is where investor protection would be best suited uh, for securities regulation. And then finally, this area, just to tee up something else briefly, these are centralized virtual currencies according to FinCEN. So the issuer of those tokens needs to register as a money services business, kind of like PayPal or Venmo do. This area are decentralized virtual currencies according to FinCEN, which means that there is no issuer, but exchanges or companies that make markets in them are money services businesses and need to register with FinCEN. In both those cases, you may also need to get state licenses for being a money transmitter, depending on the state's definition, and every state has a different definition. And this area, these tokens that are useful, is of course FTC jurisdiction because these things are actually products. And there's other things we could draw on this graph. Basically this technology touches on many overlapping segments of regulation and policy. 
and it gets really complicated really fast, which is why Coin Center uh, dedicates our work to trying to unpack this area and come up with sensible policy approaches from securities law to consumer protection to anti-money laundering. So with that, uh, I'll pass it on. Presentation, uh, Kendrick Wynn, he is the founding chief advisor of Coinlist, born in Vietnam, grew up in Palo Alto, came here from New York to present today. Kendrick. Thank you so much for that intro and uh, saving the best for last. Um, uh, you know, I'm involved with two platforms, Republic and Coinlist. Uh, two years ago, block, uh, the venture financing system was highly fragmented, primarily venture capitalists funding entrepreneurs that fit their lens of credibility. You know the saying, talent ev uh, evenly distributed, resources highly uh, localized. So we launched Republic back in 2016 to enable everyday people to actually invest in tech startups. Back then though, the blockchain ecosystem was almost you know, fully decentralized, unregulated, and a lot of people thought could not be regulated at all. In fact, people around the world funded hundreds of projects to the tune that surpassed, exceeded venture financing. However, that was the good old days, like Peter had just mentioned, nowadays if any project, if you see a project that's openly you know, launched, sailed to everyone around the world, they probably are more than just playing with fire. It's more like diving head deep into like, the pit of fire that's the SEC's wrath. Um, so out of the necessity, uh, and in you know, consultation with think tank like Peter, investors uh, in, in the space, and uh, talking to the SEC and policymakers, it became very clear that most, if not all, new projects, new tokens are gonna be securities offerings. So we launched CoinList to offer two things, compliance services, KYC ML accreditation, and a listing that would allow these projects to fundraise from wealthy accredited individuals. Well, the whole point of blockchain is to make sure that everyone can participate. So if you shut out the early supporters and basically leave them out of what potentially is the greatest wealth generation of, uh, you know, of our lifetime, that's patently unfair, it's antithetical to blockchain to begin with. So we launched Republic Crypto using equity crowdfunding rules to allow everyday people again to legally, compliantly access tokens, and hopefully some of those tokens will do, will do well. I wanna end with like two quick observations. One is that so much has been done in this space in the past six months, but this is like pre-dawn of a whole new era. I have no doubt that in six months, whatever standards we think are correct today is gonna evolve. The one thing though, similar to American democracy, the American legal system is both resilient and willing to evolve, but it definitely takes time. And the last one is on the democratization of investing. You know, you turn on the TV nowadays or listen to the news and you think that society is going to hell. And in fact, as humanity has never been better since, 1990, uh, since 1990s, over 1.3 billion people have been lifted out of poverty. We're talking about 1.3 billion people no longer go to bed hungry at night. That hasn't been the result of policies or donations. It's been entrepreneurship, small, large businesses around the world, you know, creating jobs, putting food on the table. And that has largely been the result of venture capitalists. I think that if we manage to get everyone around the world to think, it doesn't matter what income bracket or how much they make, if they can invest a tiny amount of money into businesses that they think are worthwhile, within this one generation, we can eliminate poverty altogether. And it just happens that blockchain and the global attention around it can expedite that whole process faster than I think any of us do. So I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions from the audience, uh, but I'll kick things off. Kendrick, with a follow-up for, for you, you talk about how transient and how quickly the uh, <laughs> regulatory structure right now is in Washington. Just the other week, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg going through a marathon of a grilling on Capitol Hill. 
What do you actually think is the role of the industry in self-regulation versus the role of Congress in coming out of the White House? And how are they going to work together, if you will, to actually craft some type of, of regulatory structure? Because I gotta be honest, when I talk to people out in Silicon Valley, or and here in Washington about Silicon Valley, right. they scratch their heads and they say, Silicon Valley has no idea what is coming their way. And they have no idea how the government works or even how the SEC works. They think that the SEC is one person or 10 people and it's 4,000 people with tons of departments. My answer to that very difficult question is that it's way too early to tell. I mean, the notion of a industry standard, the, the industry has to mature in order for there to be a standard. Right now, you know, it's dusty and eventually the dust will settle. And those in the industry that has some sort of an influence uh, can layer on their own lens and hopefully, uh, you know, play a role. But it's far too early to say that there should be an industry standard. I'm sure Facebook would, would also agree with that. Barry, let me ask you a, a quick question. And if anyone has questions, please raise your hand and, and I'll be sure to call on you. But Barry, to, to your point, as an investor, when you're looking into which technologies to get involved in, and you're also looking at the regulatory wave that's about to, to kind of hit uh, all of these different companies, what are you looking for in terms of how they position themselves to have a strategy to navigate those regulatory waters? For us, it's been easy. Um, we just haven't participated, by and large, in any token offerings. Um, one, I do think that most of them are securities. Uh, two, I don't think that most of these projects need a token, a unique token. Uh, so for us, investing in on the digital currency piece of our business, we just have, have avoided it. But we're also lucky because we have investments in 20 exchanges, and we own Coindesk, and we have all these businesses that will perform quite well if this uh, ICO token revolution takes off. But if it comes crashing down, we won't have we won't suffer loss. I think we have a question in the back. The gentleman with the hat. Well, actually, my name is Yaya Fanusi. When I come to this event, I don't have questions. I just give you an information which you don't know about, but which will help you do better. There are 54 countries in Africa. 2020, there's going to be a declaration that those 54 countries become, like United States of America, a political federation. So I want in your spare time, do what if and see how you restructure your projections. It's going to happen. Well, I think to his point, uh, to his point, Peter, when, when you look at internationally what's going on, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin uh, said that he wants to keep the bad guys out of the cryptocurrencies. But there seems to be a, a big discrepancy in the global economy, whether you're looking at investment opportunities, Barry, in Africa, or uh, here in the United States at the, at the terms of, of, of how quickly this is evolving, what do you make, you can't apply all of this technology, or you can't look at the regulatory structure and apply it equally internationally. There are different pockets of economies all over the world. So how do you unify that, I guess, I mean, it's question. an incredibly hard problem. The bottom line is these technologies are not just interstate, they're international by default. They travel on the internet and all that's required to use them is open source software and a connected computer. So people will be using them with each other within one country, with people in other countries all over the world, and each will have a different regulatory regime that surrounds those interactions. So it's not even a problem just on the international scale. In the US, we regulate money transmitters at a state by state level. So you need a license in Massachusetts. If you have customers in Massachusetts, you also need a license in Montana. Well, no, actually Montana's the one where you don't. It's the only one where you don't. Or in North Dakota, if you have customers in North Dakota. So you're gonna need 53 licenses from 53 states and territories with 53 different regulators that wanna examine your books if you're a money transmitter. And there are folks who are doing things with digital currencies that probably qualify as money transmission. So we have to clean our own house in the US here as far as regularizing and, and creating uniform regulations before we even begin to think about international standards that are disjoint and, and, and nondescript. Secretary Mnuchin was talking about anti-money laundering, which is a little more clear-cut in the U.S. because we have one federal regulator, FinCEN. Um, and FinCEN's kind of led the way there. And that's what Mnuchin was talking about, how we've been doing AML, KYC for exchanges that trade digital currencies since 2013. That's only now beginning to catch on in Europe with the fourth anti-money laundering directive and, and elsewhere uh, in Japan as well recently. So 
So, so we'll see that probably become more uniform sooner rather than later, but the U.S. kind of led the way there. I want to touch on something you said about just the, the confusion, because I grew up outside of Philadelphia in Delaware County, and when I was uh, talking to my, my dad last night, and I said, you know, what are you, he's, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm like, well, a bunch of different stories, but then I'm doing this thing <coughs> on ICOs and cryptocurrencies, and his first question was, what is Bitcoin? And I think that that's really the challenge that the industry faces right now, is that there's so much confusion from the consumer standpoint, here in the United States in particular, and I guess, when you look at how robo-advisors are evolving, and you could talk about the fiduciary standard, but could we see a day where baby boomers are actually getting their investments, Kendrick, from ICOs? Or is that too controversial? I think that's like the most exciting thing about this industry. Barry asked at the very beginning how many people in the room uh, own crypto assets, and I think like 30% raised their hand. A year ago, it would be like 5%, like a couple of people. And we're here in Washington, D.C., and yet still, in this highly selected group, 30%, you can imagine the rest of the world, Latin American, you know, Alabama, Vietnam, Nigeria, wherever people start adopting it, you know, that's why I'm so long on this on this technology and what it can do uh, in in the coming years. There's, 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 look, there's two um, super important demographic trends that are happening right now, which I think kind of play into this. One um, is the younger generation of investors don't buy stocks anymore. Um, the number of publicly traded companies is down something like 50 percent over the past 10, 15 years, and so there's a policymaker opportunity here to not not crush this, but to embrace this. Um, and look, I don't have all the answers as to how tokens and ICOs should be regulated, but there is an opportunity here um, to, to support this. So that's one demographic trend. The other, and this is tied towards the baby boomers, uh, I got excited about Bitcoin first and foremost, and probably till, still to this day, um, as a digital gold analog. Something um, that would um, be a store of value in times of economic dislocation, good hedge, um, I think a lot of people in Bitcoin buy it for that reason. So there is um, $30 trillion of wealth that's held by the baby boomers that's being handed down to the boomers, to our generation, my kids' generation, over the next 20 years. So of that 30 trillion, a lot of it is in gold. Um, there's seven trillion dollars of gold out there. So I believe that a, a portion of what is held in gold is not gonna stay in gold and it's gonna move into something like Bitcoin. Bitcoin as an asset class is only worth about $150 billion. So you have a $7 trillion oh asset class, well, so relative to $7 trillion for gold. So $7 trillion for gold, $150 billion for Bitcoin. If I'm right, as this demographic shift happens, you're going to see a lot of movie mon mo money move out of gold. So the baby boomers, they may not be buying ICOs, but I do think they may be buying things like Bitcoin. Well, let me ask you about China. Because should the regulatory structure, and this is my final question, if anyone in the audience has, has anyone else, and I want to give each of you a chance to, to respond to this. Should the U.S., I guess, if, if, what's the competition like over China? Because if we're not in a position in the United States to really maximize on not only here in the U.S., but also internationally, on this type of technology and to leverage it, uh, and if traditional financial institutions aren't able to push their technology forward, is the U.S. missing out on an opportunity that global competitors might be able to capitalize on? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple, yes. I mean, this is, this is a global phenomena. Development's happening all over the world. Innovation's happening all, all around the world. It is not going to stop, um, no matter what regulators do. And I think we would all love to see that innovation happening here in the US. So yeah. it's kind of like, like it or not, this technology is here to stay. And not, not, only, not only that, as far as how do we you know, make America a home for innovation and job creation in these technologies, but also if we want to continue to have some power to enforce the laws, consumer protection, anti-money laundering pr uh, uh, prevention or money laundering prevention that we currently enforce, we can't shun this technology. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. We can't outlaw it because it'll just go overseas and Americans will still be able to access it unless you shut down the internet. You know that's, just, that's just the facts. We and can't so be too confused by it. We I can't think be a lot of right. Americans right now are too confused We need by regulators it. who understand it and we need to actually have regulations that embrace it and say, yeah, this stuff's gonna exist and so let's try and achieve our anti-money laundering or investor protection uh, objectives uh, even with this new technology. And that's how you maintain some control over the policy conversation without seeding it uh, overseas, which is what you're would happen. You're the policy guy. You're, you're trying to figure out what's next. So how, how do you maintain control over that policy 
I'm not worried about uh, the U.S. banning crypto assets. Uh, the question really is the application of existing legal framework, securities law and consumer protection, and whether you should exempt this whole new asset class. And it's clear that no, there won't be just you know outright exemption. Um, secondly, I'm not all too worried about you know the flight of innovation from the U.S. We live here. We forget the gravitational pull that this economy and you know us as a people have. And any project, any protocol, if a token leak into the United States, even if they're based out in Singapore, it's still under U.S. jurisdiction. So going back to answer, answering your question, it's about continuing that dialogue here in D.C. in various state capitals, the SEC and Congress. And you know, over the next year or two, not three months, that hopefully there will be slow evolution of the existing legal framework rather than something new altogether. We have some questions. I'll Start with you, ma'am, up front, and then we'll go to you, and then I think that's all the time that we have. Uh, thank you. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I am sure high tech can create some business, but if, if we don't fix the problem as usual, as traditional economy, I don't think how can anybody fix this new technology industries. Uh, for instance, if we don't, uh, as you say, the uh, youngsters, uh, they don't start invest in stock, well, they don't because th there is no guarantee that you can have the saving keep it because they will be robbed away. The same as your home, if you are a homeowner, you will be homeless overnight. And the same as you are a millionaire, your money will be gone just suddenly in a second. So we just high tech, we just crypto or, or Bitcoin. How could you say that would be safe? No, just to give you an example, like in our economy, in our financial institution management or our government management, they can pay in cash, in crate, in cash, and then lost. So how could you guarantee that crypto or Bitcoin, your transaction somewhere will be lost? I think that's a what I think her it's a great point in the sense Kendrick that there's that confusion again about where exactly this technology is backing this type of these type of finances. So how I guess does the industry do a better job in educating the masses about that consistency and the stability of the technology? And it's probably going to be a longer answer than than this gathering permit. But the whole point of the technology is to eliminate the agents of trust that the traditional banking system, you know, puts in place. That it, you know, aut autonomize that whole system. Uh, and probably Peter can go in depth more eloquently than I can. Uh, with the, the only space. thing I'd say is is money, finance, trade. It's all data. That's that's all it is. That's all it's ever been. And that data especially as we move through the 20th century, increasingly was locked up in centralized servers controlled by centralized organizations like banks. And we had to trust them to keep those records, uh, have them have fidelity, uh, share them with regulators to accomplish investor protection, and be honest to their customers. Bitcoin, open blockchain networks, the data isn't in a siloed center anymore. It isn't in a company where we trust them to guard it and share it when they're supposed to share it. It's out in the public. It's on a blockchain, and anybody with a computer and an internet connection can see it. Now, that may not seem like good transparency to somebody who didn't grow up with computers and internet connections, but to the younger generation, that's exactly the kind of transparency they want, because they'll figure out how to grok a technological tool, download the blockchain if they need to, and actually look at the data. And if they can't do it, they'll find their tech-savvy friend to do it, rather than trust one of the big four auditors to do it for them, or their government Sh to do it Shameless for them. plug, anyone with a Bloomberg terminal, it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty good uh, source of data as well. Final question, you sir, thank you. Yeah, to uh, bridge more of the uh, international dimension of this, uh, in terms of potential for all types of uh, crypto assets, including currencies, that especially outside the U.S., uh, someone brought up Africa, and quite a number of uh, less developed and uh, least developed economies, still the number one medium of transaction is a cash. So what do you see regarding the potential for cryptography or crypto to bring much of that 
informal economy into the formal economy so governments can actually be more effective at policies that promote so prosperity because now the immediate thing that does is now you have a full record of everything that goes on. You don't have to make much guesswork about what is the actual price level of uh, these goods and services. You have that data on hand, and that's especially true with uh, mobile money where you can easily track all payments, same with Bitcoin, all these, it's fully uh, traceable. So where do you see the potential there of even supplanting cash as a payment medium in less developed regions? Well. Well, you know, one, I don't think this is necessarily a Bitcoin thing. I think it's just a natural evolution of money. Money is going digital. Um, and I, I do think that in, in economies where they're kind of cash heavy, I mean, the two clear benefits of something like, like Bitcoin or digital currency in those economies um, is, is one, uh, is safekeeping of your money. Like, you know, having physical cash is not typically a great way to store your money. But two, in a lot of these markets, um, they tend to see rapid inflation or the currency. So holding something other than your local currency tends to be a pretty, pretty good investment. Um, and so, th I mean, there's plenty of other benefits to something like Bitcoin, but those alone um, are why I'm so excited about Bitcoin and emerging markets. And the challenge is just usability. I mean, the technology makes sense for those applications, but making it something that people are comfortable using, able to use easily, culturally interested in accepting as money, because it's a very personal decision. I think if, like, if, I think if M-Pesa hadn't had the success that it had in Kenya, I would be a little more skeptical. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, mobile penetration in these markets is you know, getting as high as 60, 70, 80%, so that work's being done. And I always bring it back to Delco where I grew up. My dad still doesn't carry a debit card or a, uh, a a, ma a MasterCard. He does not. He, wow. he just carries cash. So people all over the United States in, in at my, large. In, in my office, thirty people thirty and younger don't carry physical cash. I don't carry cash. I, That's I can't the imagine difference. leaving ha the house without physical cash. But I, uh, I do not carry cash. I only carry cards. But uh, but that's that's I think there's large portions of the world, but especially here in the United States, that are just so geographically diverse. There's one thing I learned on the campaign trail. I want to thank all of our awesome panelists for, for their presentation. I also want to thank Chris Feeney and my friends Adam Rice and Allison Hawkins for inviting me here today. And thank to all of you for, uh, for, for coming and attending. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.